Hello and welcome to HR Show and Tell. You're listening to our inaugural episode of our web series dedicated to showcasing the talent and ideas right here in Alberta as it relates to people and culture. In today's episode, we feature Caroline Brookfield. Caroline is a veterinarian, stand-up comedian, and perhaps the most purposeful is how she teaches teams to be more creative. Caroline taught us what it means to bring your whole brain to work and to truly stop the rhetoric of right and left brain thinking. It simply isn't one way or the other. It all starts now. So welcome to our first, our very first uh, HR show and tell. I'm your host, Michelle Berg, and I am the chief visionary officer over at Elevated HR. I am a big fan of the idea that we can have uh, collaboration instead of competition. And the purpose of the HR show and tell is to not hide what we are doing in HR, but honestly to celebrate it. Caroline in particular talked about creativity and creativity at work. And so after that, what I realized was was like, oh man, I can bring Caroline into a lot of the different team building events. We do um, um, essentials for leadership. And I brought her in to to train um, a couple of leaders. And the thing is, I knew she was going to want to do some interesting things with them. And and that was exactly what I wanted. I wanted them to be pulled out of their shell a little bit. Um, and, and the, and Caroline is just so good at that. Um, you know, and she believes that creativity is that key to teams and quite honestly, it's a behavioral trait that is so sought after, but I really feel like it's rare in existence. I feel like when we recruit, it's one of those, those things that's in every job description. And then when I go to ask the question in an interview, so what have you done to be creative? People go right away to like either painting or writing books or whatever that looks like. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not where I want. I That's not how I see creativity. I see creativity in how you look at a problem or, or you know, how you look at a file system and how can we do this differently and be more efficient. And, and that's exactly what I watched Caroline do with the group of people that um, we were doing in our leadership essentials is she really drew out of them a different way of looking at, at those problems. Um, and so today we're going to really talk about how exactly we can tap into creativity um, because I, I know that Caroline in particular believes it exists in everyone. So back to Disrupt HR though, and I will say this, this is where Caroline, you were totally after my own heart. You quoted Hemingway, which is one of my favorites, uh, you know, write drunk, edit sober. And I know lots of people say he didn't actually say that. And he doesn't, you know, he only started drinking in the afternoon, but whatever. (laughs) Um, I got, I got it at that point. I was like, you're right. Like the key to creativity is getting free, being liberated, being okay with being silly. And someone like me, I really struggle at being silly. And I really just, I find my whole body cringing around it. But what I, one of my um, thoughts for this year in particular was like, I really want to tap into play. And as I've been tapping into play, what a difference it's made for me to even looking at how I look at Elevated, how I look at my, my own team. And, and again, it brought me back to in December when I was, you know, somewhat of an an attendee at that same group. And I just thought this is amazing. So anyways, with no further ado, Caroline Brookfield, thank you so, so, so much for being here today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I just always love working with you and your group. We're so much fun. (laughs) Well, speaking of that, like the truth is you're a veterinarian by trade, but what I also really love about your bio is that you're a stand-up comedian as well. And then of course you're now this facilitator. Um, So how the heck does that happen? Like, let's just start there. Uh, how do you go from veterinarian to, okay, let's, and maybe you can tell us like the small story about being a stand-up comedian, but <laughs> you, how did you get into even like, yeah, that is total right brain, left brain, right? Yeah. Well, it, it's a lot of people ask me that question because it is a bit unusual, my path of development, whatever you want to call it. Um, and full disclaimer, like, I believe we shouldn't be doing the same thing for 20 plus years. Um, I think that's probably one of the reasons we all resist creativity and learning because we get so good at something we don't like the feeling of not knowing uh, other disclaimer is I have ADHD and not in a haha I like to chase squirrels like I legitimately have ADHD so I find um, 
I get interested in a lot of different things. And so that's just my, my personality. Um, but it kind of goes, I, I guess I see like on a big picture, like I see life as like a series of like concentric doors, like circles of doors, and you just kind of keep walking through doors until it happens. And, you know, there's that quote by Steve Jobs, like you can't connect the dots moving forward, only backwards. And if I look backwards, I saw that, um, you know, I'd always wanted to be a vet because I, you know, always loved animals. And so obviously the vet was the obvious career. And I hit high school and I really loved performance and drama and photography. And, you know, at that time, it would have been like late 80s. I had really not the talent to become an actor and I didn't really want to live in a basement apartment all my life. And I had no really idea how to pursue any other career. And so be, ironically being a vet was like the easiest choice and it was a great choice. And I love being a vet, but time and time again, through my 24 ish year career, I keep coming back to this creativity. And um, one of the jobs um, at the doors I walked through was a job I wasn't expecting. I was recruited for a corporate position where public speaking was a big part of the job mm -hmm. and I loved it. And um, I loved educating people. I loved making it fun. I got like an innovation award for turning technical training into a game because like how boring is technical training, right? right. So, um, so th and then I, you know, I had some businesses. I was drawn to entrepreneurship, you know, moving around different parts of that medicine. And um, at one point I think I thought, well, everybody else hates public speaking, like a fate worse than death or whatever that, you know, that mm -hmm. idea is. And I really like it. So maybe I should just do that. And so I kind of just, and, and so then that became the, the thought of, well, what should I talk about? And, you know, I did a lot of self-reflection and, you know, reading. And one of the podcasts I listened to about speaking said, you should speak about what people ask you about. And people are always like, how did you, what do you like, just like you said, like, what, how did you do that? Like, you know, I went backpacking and, you know, I do a lot of like different sports, like rock climbing and, and I was like, well, I guess I should talk about that. And then because of my science background, I got fascinated with the topic of creativity. Like, you know, what is creativity? How do we define it? And what happens in our brain? Is it right brain, left brain, which it isn't. Um, and, you know, just kind of that followed that started opening those doors. And then here we are today. Yeah, well, again, that which is awesome. So let's just jump right into it specifically as a, as we're talking about teams and things like that. So, so when it comes to creativity with teams, what's the holdup? Like, why do teams struggle at creativity so much? What, what have you seen? Uh, I think the number one thing that holds teams and anybody up really is this fear of judgment, kind of like that cringy feeling you were talking about, like, oh, what are people going to think? Because we have this um, idea of how we should be at work and this idea of what, you know, even within a culture of a company, what it looks like to be successful at that company. And it almost feels like we have to choose either, um, you know, artistic or like people think of creativity as artistic versus, you know, corporate and serious and, you know, all those other things that go along with being in a corporation. And, and so then what's your go-to move? So you know this, you know that when you get asked to come into organizations or you're working regardless, whether it's leadership team or it's just teams in general, and you're trying to really tap into their creativity, what's your go-to move or what's your topic that you explore um, when it comes to creativity with teams? Yeah, so my, my go-to topics are usually around my framework, which is dance, which is five things you can do um, to encourage creativity. Um, I wrote, you know, during COVID, I was like, well, I could write a book. So I wrote a book. I'm in the process of figuring out how to publish that. Um, but I usually use that as a framework because it's an easy thing for people to anchor to. Um, another popular topic that I've been speaking a lot about is um, how creativity can help and how it intersects with the decision making we make in uncertain times because um, we make usually poor decisions in uncertainty. So those are kind of my go to topics. And then as far as you know, dealing with teams, it's really very, it's really like, actually, in some ways, like veterinary medicine, every team is totally different, like every animal is totally different. So I really try to meet them where they are at. So some teams have high cohesion, they have high trust, they're you know, they're ready to jump in. And so, you know, we'll, I'll challenge them with a little bit more of a, a challenging exercise. And then there's other teams where um, they might not be as comfortable or used to expressing themselves. So I try to make sure that the exercises and um, topics that we cover are a little bit safer. So uh, 
at the end of the day, I really try to find that comfort zone wherever that's at and just try to push the edges of it. And that's different for every group. Nice. Okay. So let's go back to what does dance stand for? Oh, so yeah, dance is um, because I have to remember easy, easy way to remember things. So dance is an acronym. So it's five things that you can do to build creativity. Because one of the problems I see in companies and teams is everybody talks about innovation, something like 80% of companies have innovation as a core value, but nobody talks about creativity. And everybody's creative, like you had mentioned, I, I believe and also research proves that everybody's creative. So then what's the hang up? It's the environment to allow your own creativity to shine. So to answer your question, dance stands for daydream, ambiguity, novelty, curiosity, and editing later. I couldn't think of an E word and I didn't want to do like, you know, anyway, it, dance was a good acronym. So those are like five things you can do. Like it takes a few minutes a day, which help you um, build a creativity, build an environment that creativity can thrive in. Okay. So let's go back to COVID and where people were under high stress, right? And, the, and as you just said, they're making poor decisions during high, high stress periods. How did you, or how were you utilized or why would people bring you in in particular um, to really support them through that? Or did you find that that's what was happening? It was like, oh man, we need, we need a different way to look at this right now. Yeah, I think what I found is that there was a mix. And so obviously the people coming to me wanted that different approach and wanted to look at things differently. I think some companies and some people are not aware of that. They just go to status quo thinking, which is what we do in uncertainty. And they just double down on that. Like they hit the nail harder with the hammer instead of finding another nail or screw. I don't know what the analogy is there, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the people who, um, who brought me in realized that they were maybe going down that same path and they knew it was the wrong way, but they didn't really know how to do things differently. So they wanted to kind of back up and, and just try to explore things differently. And, um, you know, one of the things I did recently is became level two certified in the creative problem solving method, which is a really powerful and very established framework for um, how to take people through an idea to um, implementation. Um, so a lot of people like that because it's like something they can kind of hang their hat on. There's something, there's like a, a process to follow, which is a little more comfortable than uh, just exploring creativity. Okay. And then you talk, touch there a little bit around trust and, um, we do a lot of work within trust because I feel again, like even, even if we go just to, you know, the, the typical book that's out there, five dysfunctions of a team, trust is the foundation basically. And if you don't have trust, it's very difficult to move, you know, move your way through. So I totally get that. But what I really saw when you came in and facilitated for the group that we had, this was actually a, one of those ways like creativity and like, which is it? Is it the chicken or the egg? Like, do you need creativity before you can trust? Or do you need trust before you can, you can actually create that, you know, feel safe enough to be creative? What do you, what do you say there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think they're interrelated. I don't know if there's one before the other. I mean, you think about some of the statistics, like 18% um, of people in the workplace feel like they can take creative risks at work. Like that's really very low. But in companies that embody a creative principle, that, that bumps up to like seven or eight out of 10 people feel like they can take risks. So definitely, I think you need that trust and safety to foster a creative, um, creative workforce and employees. Um, but you're right, like working together also creates trust. So we know that uh, teams that do creative uh, exercises or do create together, they have a higher team cohesion. And do they have higher team cohesion and more trust because they created together or, you know, like I agree, I don't know that I could say it was one versus the other, but they're definitely very, very interrelated. I think you couldn't be creative in an area where you didn't feel comfortable or like you had trust. And I think um, the other the converse is true as well. Okay. No, makes sense. And so I think like the way that I saw it anyways, was you, you, you got through to the group anyways that you worked with with me. I feel like you got through to them in, in a unique and different way. They certainly were uncomfortable. Like there's no question <laughs> that you were pushing them. And it, you said around the edges, I feel like you pushed this, this group of individuals in particular um, 
in, and probably not nearly as far as you pushed others, but to set the stage, I mean, they were field techs, supervisor field techs, they're in the field, they've grown up in oil and gas, they feel like this is life, I don't need to be creative. And now she's asking me to do a bunch of stuff and on a technology, so we'll get into that, but in, on a technology that I can't use this, and yet all of them were fine in the end, all of them really showed up. All of them came up with, like, I think they almost were giggling by the end of it. And cause it's just something that they never do at work at all. And what I have to say about that too, and I don't even think you know this is, so at the end of the leadership essentials that we do, we make them all do a presentation about what they've learned and how they've, um, you know, <clears throat> how they're gonna apply the principles of leadership essentials at the end. And so many of them said, you know, I went into this session in particular, it was a brand new facilitator. They didn't, you know, they didn't know you from anyone. And they were real, they recognized that the value of coming out of their shell and what a difference that had made that day, but even that week. And then I have to even admit like the presentations that they put together were just so beyond and they said it was beyond our capabilities beyond anything that they've ever been asked to do but they knew they could do it because you had given them a foundation uh, for success so i thought that was super cool and again yeah. you did it so fast it was like a two and a half hours like it wasn't like this um all day thing you just it was like exercise and theory exercise and theory and it for them it just was really they were able to connect with almost that inner child mm -hmm. um and so for you though like i i feel like when i saw you live i could tell like you love and crave the energy of being around an audience there's there's no question even as hard as disrupt hr is it's a completely unique and environment but i could tell like you create like again the energy of people mm -hmm. You've recently now moved your practice, you, you know, by necessity <laughs> to online. Um, what's been the most rewarding and what's been the most challenging and what are those hurdles? You know, there's a lot of business owners, a lot of um, even HR practitioners that are on, on, on as participants here today. And they're like, oh, can you really teach creativity through Zoom? And so what have you found? What's, what, what has been the key to the success of 2020 for you? Well, I think it's like anything, you just have to back up. And the mistake I see people making online, in my opinion, is basically trying to take their live experience and put it online, right? So I think it's the question of backing up and that's where creative problem solving methodology is helpful because you get back up and you're like, well, what's the point? Like the point is to try to help people um, have an enjoyable time that they are enjoying the time that we spend together and they leave with some takeaways and some actionable items. So um, I try to incorporate uh, exercises that could use the technology. So, you know, to your point, um, I used to, there's a bunch of tools like Mural and Miro. And with the group, um, with your group, we used Miro, which was a bit of a stretch because I didn't know, like some of them were on their phone. So they couldn't actually even see it properly. So the one um, participant had to tell me what to write, like he could see it, but he couldn't actually participate. So I think a lot of it is just going with the flow and it goes back to that fear of judgment, like just be willing to take a risk and um, being adaptable. So, you know, I've started presentations with obviously a plan in mind, and then sometimes the plan's completely derailed because my plan isn't really meeting the attendees where they are. So um, I might think I'm gonna spend five minutes on something, but all of a sudden it's, people are asking questions, they're engaged, and it's like, well, this seems to be what you need right now. Um, because you can still do a lot of experiential things. So you can use the whiteboard, you can use something like Mural or Miro. Um, you can do fun things like getting people to turn their camera off or using, um, you know, raising their hands. Um, I did uh, one activity with a women's leadership group where I didn't tell them what we were doing with it, but I just told them to bring a blank piece of paper and take notes and write down key takeaways. And um, actually this one thing about online learning that I think is really helpful is giving people time to reflect. So if I do like a longer one, I give them like a couple of minutes self-reflection. So in this group, they did that. And at the end, we took like the printer paper and we folded it into, we did an origami thing together and we folded our piece of paper into a pyramid. So then they could like keep that on their desk or hang it from a window or something if they felt like. So I think it's, uh, it's about being creative essentially and not constraining yourself to um, doing what you feel like has to be done 
on a live format online and also um, feeling your audience out, you know, which is important in any performance to know how people are responding and taking your cues from them. Right. So what's this Miro? Like uh, for someone who hasn't heard of what Miro is, I know you love it, but what, what is it? What's the technology? Is it easy to access, easy to understand and learn? Yeah, I mean, there's things. So Miro is a program that um, I have a paid subscription, but I think there's some free ones. There's Miro, which is M-I-R-O, which is the one I chose. There's also Mural, it's M-U-R-A-L. There's some free ones as well. So there's like group whiteboards and even within Zoom, like you can actually allow people to annotate right over your face if you want them to, or you can bring up a blank screen and have them all annotate something. So um, so there's many different tools. And Miro is almost like a massive, massive whiteboard. So it's even hard to explain what you can do with it, but you can attach it to things like Unsplash. So you can do a vision board and pe people can pull images off the internet and put them on the vision board. You can do, uh, they have templated ex exercises as well. So let's say you wanna do a brainstorming exercise. You can search, there's probably like a dozen different brainstorming templates and you pull it up and it actually is a computer whiteboard and it has all the sticky notes and people can write on the sticky notes or move them around. So it's um, basically an online interactive whiteboard. And one of the reasons I like that as well is because I feel like um, kind of like what you were saying, Michelle, earlier about being on camera, I think sometimes it's exhausting being on camera and seeing yourself. And this is a way to, to collaborate in real time, but not have to worry so much about that FaceTime and being on camera. Yeah. And I mean, you, like you bring such a structured ap approach to, to again, in a way, like again, I, and I know you actually, you said earlier, it's not right brain, left brain. What is it then? What well, it's whole brain. You're, yeah, it's whole brain. So the, the, the fallacy is that it's your right brain uses creativity and your left brain doesn't. But what we're discovering are not we, what researchers are discovering with technology like functional MRI, we can actually see what's happening in the brain. The whole brain lights up. And one of my favorite stories about that, if, if you'll indulge me, do I have time to tell you my, so one of my favorite research stories is when, is when they found out what's called the default mode network. And this researcher was trying to figure out what people's brains did during a certain task. So we did task A and task B. And in research, you're supposed to have a control, right? So he was like, well, what's a control? Uh, I'll get them to think about nothing. So that way it'll be like a baseline. So like when he was thinking, I'm going to get him to think about nothing, it would be like no activity would be taking place, I think was the assumption. And actually, and this researcher didn't even recognize it. It was like many years later, when they looked back, and they realized that the brain was like more active when it was thinking about nothing. And parts of the brain that don't normally communicate that they didn't know communicated actually were communicating. So, um, you know, it's, it's a whole brain activity. And there's the kind of three main parts of creativity. Um, one is the um, salience network, which is the like kind of the traffic controller. It decides who's going to be in charge. And then there's our executive function, which is like what we think of our front, like our frontal cortex, our thinking brain. And then there's the divergent part. And um, you need all three parts because, like, I think about you know that group I facilitated with you. Like I I would not be able to invent some technology to whatever they do with oil rigs. Like I have no idea because I have no expertise in that domain. I have no knowledge. Um, it would be like if I'm trying to sculpt something out of marble, I wouldn't know how hard to hit the hammer or the chisel or where to do it. And so creativity takes all of those components into consideration and it takes your whole brain to think about something creative. Cool, yeah. And then, so, again, when you're kind of in that pitch process and you're speaking to, again, people who are wanting to potentially bring you on, they're feeling you out, that kind of a thing, what's the easiest way or what's the easiest way that you show a return on investment on how you can help groups to become more creative? What's, what's your go-to move there, or conversation or pitch? I guess people are coming to me because often for me specifically, they want something um, a little bit more engaging and interactive and fun. And, you know, with my background doing, like you said, the stand up, and um, I try to make <clears throat> things very interesting. And so I think when people are coming to me already, they're coming to me with the idea that they want something light and something a little bit different. And, um, you know, what I tell them is, you know, look, everybody says they want innovation and they focus on innovation, but create individual creativity is 
half of the battle. And how do you get individual creativity without engaging with individuals with their creativity? And so that's what I'm really good at. I help people, like you said, come out of their shell, stretch their comfort zone a bit, kind of giggle a little bit, hopefully, and learn learn that they have a capacity for creativity because a lot of people just say, I'm not creative. So I guess that's where I come from. I don't know. That's not a very concise answer, but. No, no, it totally, it's, it's, it's awesome because I, I mean, at the end of the day too, again, that's where as an HR professional, we've got, and we're pitching this, you know, to the executives of the organization. I think what I'm hearing first and foremost, if, if innovation is one of our core values, and I would agree with you, like, first of all, I would just say innovation is a lame core value right now because <laughs> I mean if you're not innovating you're dying right so um sorry to anyone who has that as your core value <laughs> but if the truth is if you're not ever talking about how you're innovating or even how what you're innovating but yet how you're innovating like what are you doing to really pull you know pull people out of the box I mean we've all heard the stories right? Google has, is a Google that has the FedEx days where they, their, their one plan is they, they have the day, but they've got to mail it by tomorrow. Basically, I think, oh. I mean, I'm, I'm totally missing the, I don't know. I, I know I Google has the 20%. They're supposed yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. butchering everything because that's, okay. that's what I do, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, you know, so they give them the space and the, and, and then, so there is that, like you, when you've seen the most people get the most, maybe that's a better question, is when you've seen people get the most out of what you do and what you bring, is there a key ingredient that's required at the leadership level? Um, and, you know, like, what does that look like for, for that company? Is it, do you need great leadership that are already inspires? Are you giving space, like even psychological safety, right? Of being psychological safe through those types of things. What does that look like? Is, is there something there where you go, you know what, if you let me in, I'm really going to help versus there's no way, it doesn't matter what I talk about, this team is never going to become creative. Is there a key ingredient that's needed, required? Yeah, I think you kind of hit the, like you kind of touched on that, which is the safety and the buy-in from leadership. And I don't think the leadership necessarily has to understand it, but I think they have to be, um, they have to let go a little bit. They have to be willing to let a little bit, a little bit go. Cause that's one of the keys to creativity is um, the least creative companies are the most micromanaged, the most where the supervisors are on them and the most where like, everybody's got to know what everybody else is doing. Um, and if that's the company and they're not interested in backing off at all, then I don't think that it would be successful because it is something like 88% of people think that they that creativity is beneficial to their company and society, yet only 18% of people feel that they can take risks to be creative at work. So it has to be an environment where it doesn't have to be like Google, but it has to be an environment where people are willing to like have a bit of a mess, right? Yeah. Like maybe not the whole house, but you know, maybe the kitchen a bit messy. Yeah. Well, actually that's a really good segue into, you know, like I love me a good failure story. And that, <laughs> you know, and especially if you allow people to fail and and really reflect back and look at that. So um, I'm actually gonna go right at you in terms of a facilitator, yeah. you know, what have you bombed in the past, even like with the group, like were they, you know, or or have you never bombed? Like, has it always been successful for you? Because if so, I want to know even more of your secrets. Yeah. Well, I think that part of it is this, and this is my, I get a bit of on a soapbox, is that what is failure, really? Um, because, you know, the best successes come out of after often the biggest failures, if you want to use a metric on it. Um, I failed, like, bombed for sure, stand-up comic. I mean, that's a given. Um, I was hosting... Um, I'd never hosted before. It was a very new comic and I'm still like, still quite inexperienced. Um, but I was really inexperienced and I went up to do my set and people were completely ignoring me. Like I had no idea how to host or to get their attention back. It was like a fundraiser. So they were eating dinner and it was a bad setup and I just kind of didn't know what to do. So I just finished my set and, uh, yeah, that was a pretty bad bomb. And then as far as being a facilitator, you know, I don't know that I've bombed specifically. There was one case, um, 
I should be conscious of our time because it might be a bit of a long story. I was presenting to a group of experts and they were creativity experts. And I was actually really nervous because they put me as like the first keynote of the whole thing. And I wasn't a part of this organization I wanted to be. And these are people who this is their living is creativity. So, but I did it anyway. And it actually went really well. I had a lot of really good feedback. So I wouldn't say I bombed, but I missed, I, I mistook the time. So I finished about 10 minutes earlier than I needed to. And um, I had a slide in there, and this kind of goes to, I think, a topic close to your heart, Michelle. I had a slide in there that I'd chosen, and this is around um, uh, the, uh, black, you know, with G George Floyd and like a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff. And I had deliberately tried to um, make my, my presentation more inclusive. So I had chosen, I had like the seven things you can do to increase your tolerance of ambiguity. And one of the things is be assertive. And I just, you know, like I go on the stock photo site and I'm like, oh, what's, what's a good example of being assertive? And I picked this woman who is a black woman and she was gorgeous, but, and she was like, you know, assertive. Um, my Q and A got com like completely derailed because I really offended somebody and it was really hard because I was like, of course, as soon as they mentioned, there's, I guess, some stigma about um, black women being aggressive and that it wasn't a good representation. And I, as soon as they mentioned that, I was like, oh, but like, I hadn't even, like, I don't have, I didn't have, as far as I know, that stigma. And so I really struggled with that. And I struggled with, um, with my ego jumping in because I instantly wanted to explain myself and I instantly wanted to like go offline and I like explain like, I, no, no, that's not what I meant. And I didn't know. And then this resistance to, um, you know, if I removed that slide, which is what I ended up doing, am I then now perpetuating the fact that there was this stereotype that I didn't know about? Anyway, it was a really, mm. It wasn't a bomb in that sense, but it was a bomb in the sense that I missed the mark and, and I, I offended somebody and it was a really um, introspective time to try to figure out how do I balance that, you know, make because you can't make everybody happy, but making sure I'm not offending somebody or making sure that I'm being sensitive. So that's something that I'm always trying to be cautious about. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I tend to offend always. So that is that is certainly <laughs> like... I've just been used to that, but honest, like I, for a long time, I thought that that was just, that was okay. That's who I am. I'm provocative and I, and I'll own that, you know, I, and, and even longer than that, I kind of thought, yeah, you either hate me or you like me. Like I'm cool with that, but I'm not like, like let's, I really have zero intent on, but that's just the thing around it. Right. Intention versus impact is always so it's so different. And recognizing that our words and our choices and what it is that we do always ends up having an impact. We've got to be aware, like becoming more conscious about it. And that's what I've found in particular. I have shied away from creativity. I, I don't fancy myself as a creative person at all. But what I have found is when I do certain exercises, certain creative exercises for me personally in my own career, the consciousness level of, of a, allowing me to be more present, to show up more present for my team, to be open to more ideas and things that are out there, that creativity lens has certainly expanded. And I think that's exactly what you said. It's not about the right brain or left brain anymore. It is this whole brain, which is so cool. So, uh, you know, let me ask you this, you know, as business owners or, or HR professionals that are here right now, what's an exercise we could do individually that not just like go draw something, not look at, you know, you, you talked about daydream. There are many type A personalities out there that almost want to know, what should I daydream about, right? And I know that's not what it is, um, but is there an exercise? Is there something that we could do on our own? And then maybe even once we, I will never say we master it, but once we try it out, we feel it out that we could bring to our teams. Is there something that we could take away here that you would recommend in terms of that exercise? Yeah, I think fundamentally what creativity does is like boot camp for facing uncertainty. It's kind of what you were saying about, you know, what like that lens. So anytime you do anything creative, you're stepping into 
uncertainty. You don't know how it's going to look when you finish your painting. You don't know how it's going to look when you put your, until you put your outfit together or, or make a meal. So it's that practice of stepping into uncertainty and being willing to face failure um, that can go into all parts of your life. So when you talk about what I exercise to do, that's why I created the, like the dance acronym, acronym. So the daydream ambiguity novel. So one of the easiest things to do is to be curious. Um, just develop a culture in yourself of curiosity and just looking at like, like a mug, like my Starbucks mug and be like, oh, that's, you know, what is curious? Why did they make it out of metal? And like, what did they use to seal it? And, you know, just things that you take for granted every day, starting to be curious because that is going to start opening up the possibility. Because first of all, it, it takes vulnerability to be curious and creative. Right. And so for me, it's not even so much about like, what do I do? It's more of a mindset of being willing to be vulnerable, be willing to not know the answer and be willing to sit in that space of uncertainty. Um, one of my favorite authors, Bo Lotto, who um, has this amazing TED talk, by the way, which you should watch with Cirque du Soleil. Um, he talks about going from you don't go from A to B, you go from A to not A. And you have to be sitting in the not A space before you can go to the next step. And so that's where I think um, being curious and if it's a specific thing, I mean, there's, I, you know, I have a PDF of like 25 things you can do um, to kind of get used to being in that space. Um, but curiosity would be a big thing. The other one that's super easy is the novelty. So just buy a different coffee or pick up a magazine you would never otherwise buy or have someone like the the guys that we worked with in that leadership have them pick a, a instructional video for me to watch like be about some I don't know pipe fitting or I don't know what right yeah. so just like finding novel experiences and being curious about things around you I think um, is super easy to do and I don't know if that's kind of what you were looking for as far as Oh yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, often I find anyways, as an HR practitioner, and we're talking about creativity or, or even executives or business owners who are talking to me about creativity. And they're like, I just don't know how to make my team more creative. Like I want them to look at this problem with a different lens on it. What, what are some, you know, again, I think we're all looking for like the fast way to solve all of our issues. Let's be real. I mean, that's who we, yeah. who we are, but it's even like that. It's the questions. And again, you coming back to the facilitation that you did, you, you, you know, would have this wild problem, a problem that they would never have to solve. And then you'd ask them to come up with different ways to solve that problem. And then once they've got their brain going from that perspective on something that's easy and dare I say safe and an easy place to be vulnerable, now it's okay, let's take those skills and transfer them back into the problem at hand that we're having in the organization too. And if you can create that network of safety or that foundation of safety over here on being silly together, mm -hmm. chances are you're much more vulnerable now when you really have to solve a problem creatively. Because the, the thing that I get specifically, again, in some of, some of the industries that we work in is, you know, well, that's the way we've always done it, mm -hmm. right? Like they're stuck in these ways, but what if we did it differently? And then, but then people always keep trickling back to what's again, what's familiar, what's safe. And that's where I think like you came in and you go, no, 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 let's forget all that. Yeah. What's a different way to come in and do it. <clears throat> and again, I have, and that's, go ahead. I was gonna say that speaks um, like what, what I, th I think of when we talk about that and that actually is the advantage of me coming in as a veterinarian to, uh, you know, right. to that group is that's what cross-functional creative like collaboration is so such a catalyst for creativity and also you do need the time like you can't just like make it happen it's the uh, complete opposite to productivity and there's things that you can do um you know very proven and specific things you can do to increase creativity but you can't just rush it and um you know like when uh, steve jobs got involved with pixar um there's a great book about that called creativity inc and i think like they, they only had one bank of bathrooms for the entire complex. So all the engineers, all the animators, all the HR, everybody had to basically go and use the same bathroom because they realized the value of these like um, sudden and spontaneous discussions. They had like a blackboard in the bathroom. You could just write random ideas on. And I don't know how that all worked in practice, but this idea of, um, you know, you know, and that's what that's what novelty does is you collect all these different data sets and the more different people and different experiences you collect, the easier you can take that analogy, like you said, over here and use it over here. But if you 
stay in your own zone and stay where you're comfortable, your data sets are going to be like so concentrated that you're not going to be able to think more divergently and think about different ideas. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, you know, we've just started off 2021. Um, I think we can all say that first week of January was a little bit different than most people were expecting, you know, just when you watch what is in the U.S. right now. Um, but as we continue to move in and we get through, well, we won't necessarily get through COVID. I think I even saw there was this weird, like, you know, vaccines are definitely not necessarily going to be a thing until for way longer than that what they are originally advertising. Um, so how, you know, knowing, knowing that we have all just come through a year that no one could have anticipated. It was funny, I was reading my journals back in March. And I and I remember like all the negative thoughts that I had and how stupid this all was. And then April, oh, shit, I guess this is what we really are, you know, and then and then it just kept going. But anyways, long story short, we've now we've done hard things. That's what I really like about, you know, and that is probably steal, stealing a little bit from Glennon Doyle, who says it all the time, but we can do hard things. Awesome. How are you now using creativity to really expand your practice within 2021? Yeah, that's funny. I'm so glad you told me that because that's actually my phrase of the year is I can do hard things and I didn't know where it came from. Yeah. So I appreciate you telling me the source, which is nice. Um, so how am I using creativity? Well, I mean, it's it's still about walk those doors and just trying different doors and seeing what works. Um, I think it's about um, connecting with people as much as possible. I think networking is really important and uh, intentionally learning and trying to be of service. And that's one of the things I always do with any of any of the things I do is like, what is going to serve my customer or my client or my connection or whoever it is the most and not get hung up on my agenda and like what I think they should be doing, because I just want to help people do what they think they need. And that might not be, you know, what they think they need is might not be what they actually need, but trying to see people where they are, I think is what I'm focused on right now. Okay, very cool. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna jump in to, um, there's a couple of questions here that I've got anyway, so let me jump into that. Are you ready for some, like, I have no idea what's in here. And I've actually been on a panel before. Actually, I think there's someone, one of the attendees that's here anyways has been on a panel where I have been blindsided. So- um, <laughs> Okay, with the uncertainty, I'm- uh... Here we go, let's get into that uncertainty, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so this is a good question. Um, what do you do with people that think all of this is total crap? Like, how do you, how, you know, how do you even approach that conversation, especially, I would think in this case, probably around participants or things like that, when they say like creativity exercises, we don't need this BS. How do you, how do you handle those objections, essentially? Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, I'm imagining like I've got a group and like maybe one or two people are just like, this is stupid. I have to be here, that kind of thing. That's what I, I that's what I've yeah. got from this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it kind of goes back to meeting them where they are. And that's, I think one of the advantages I have with my background is that a lot of those people who resist creativity, the reluctant creative, I call them, um, they do it because they feel like they're in this bucket that's um, defined who they are. And it's like a science tech or a bucket that uh, makes them more serious. Some people feel that creativity is frivolous or it's for kids and grandmas. And there's this like personal brand about being serious and effective and productive and creativity doesn't fit in with that. So for those people, um, I try to go back a little bit to the data and the science. And I try to talk a little bit more about um, kind of incontrovertible facts as opposed to you know, the more fluffy. And that's where I shine is because of my ability to interpret scientific information the way I can, I can say, look, like, you know, in these fMRI studies the you know, when you're doing creativity, it does this and that. And, you know, I really rely heavily on data and statistics. So I tend to lean more into that for those people, because I think that's what they need. And I, I don't force them. I just kind of like, it's about meeting people where they are. So where someone might be jumping in and doing like an improv activity um, for those people, maybe it's just about um, writing something on a piece of paper or a sticky note, like to them, that's a stretch of their comfort zone. Um, because most of because the, there's internal and external, right? So the external is getting up in front of an audience and telling a joke or doing improv or, you know, sharing your thoughts. But there's also that inter internal critic. And if you don't, address your internal critic, you'll never get to that external ability. So I think the first step for those people for me is to try to get them to consider the possibility that 
they're criticizing their own good ideas and holding themselves back. And it's more of an internal thing than external, if that makes any sense. Yeah, totally makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I, and I have to say, I mean, that is, that is the one thing that I find so fascinating when I have conversations with you is you, you so easily move from, um, an exercise to the data and you've really got, I, I think that's what I value about you too, is it, it satisfies that, that part of my brain where there is science behind this, where there is a need for this. I mean, I'm the same person who hated meditation for a long, long time. And then someone made the connection for me that said, well, just because you meditate once, are you good at anything you ever do once? Like if you go to the gym, do you expect now to run a marathon just once? And so recognizing that it's a muscle, I think like creativity in a lot of ways is that muscle. And it leads to when you can really get people again to come out of their shell, to feel safe, there's a direct correlation to higher engagement, higher motivation. Oh. There's no question about yeah. that, you know, and executives, I mean, if executives question that in terms of ROI, why they would want to invest in that, I really think it comes down to trust and safety. You can create more of that with creativity. Mm -hmm. um, I've got another question here too that says, and it's kind of, I think, in line with where the last one we just had, but is there anything you can do to help people get creative without it being hokey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I can't actually, I just want to back up quickly to talk about data because there is a ton of data showing a direct correlation with creative companies and higher um, uh, organic revenue. Yeah. So it was Gallup, Gallup, Gallup or Adobe. One of them did a, a, a whole big, huge analysis and found that the companies that meet, met the three kind of conditions to, for creativity had 67% more likely to have higher than average organic revenue returns. So there are direct statistics linking creative um, workforce with revenue. So um, I wanted to say that because there is for those who need statistics. Um, Sorry, what was the other question? I was oh, so the, the one that just came up here. Is there anything you can do to help people get creative without it being hokey? Yeah. And, 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 and they go on to say, for example, I can't do improv. I can't push improv, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I would say like, um, you know, you, you can be creative without doing singing kumbaya and finger painting. So I think it depends on if you're doing it like as a facilitated exercise or more like an encouraging people. And I think it goes back to that dance framework is um, the idea of daydreaming. And, and you're right, there is kind of a right way to daydream. So um, you have to be careful you're not ruminating because I think we've all had that case where we've had a conversation and we're like staring out the window and all we're thinking about is like that bad thing we said or whatever. Um, but if you think about a problem that you're trying to solve or something that interests you and then you daydream, that's actually very productive because then your brain will be simmering on that. So mm -hmm. encouraging time for daydreaming. Things like having nature, like going getting outside or having images is also very helpful for building creativity. Um, and then you know, building a culture of whether it's in small ways that it's okay to fail. And I think to me, that's the biggest barrier for creativity is this idea of being judged and that failure is going to be penalized. So I think building a culture or allowing people to take small risks or ch chances, which is different for everybody, but then being it's okay to fail, right? Like one of my favorite stories is, um, I'm blanking on her name, the lady who developed Sp Spanx. Um, Sarah Blakely. Right. And she talks about sitting at the dinner table with her dad and her dad would say, how did, what did you fail at today? Mm -hmm. And if she didn't have anything, he's like, then you're not doing anything interesting. Like she would, he would encourage that failure. So I don't know if that answers your question. If you're looking yeah. more for facilitation things, it would be, you know, it could be, there's so many different exercises that aren't, um, improv, like even, um, you know, brainstorming exercises you can do. You can do it. One of the ones I like, which is kind of fun is the opposite. So, um, or things that can get you fired. That's always a fun one. So what are the things well, that we do can that do? One. Let's do that one. Let's, let's, let's just show them. Let's, yeah. Let's okay. go that real quick. Okay. So what, what's, what's the question? What, what kind of, oh, oh, I like that one. What are the things you can do to get fired? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What well, can you do to fire? So you just say, so I'll tell you a story about that. This is one I learned through my uh, creative problem solving facilitation. So this must've been before like internet and stuff, but it was a company that sold um, glassware and they were finding that um, the employees who are packing the glasses were slow because they were reading the newspaper. 
And so they were like, how do we get them to stop reading the newspaper and pack the glasses properly? So they did this, what's well, going to get you fired? And they kept, and, and creativity takes time. So usually on this kind of exercise, everybody says the most obvious ones. And then there's this silence and it's having to be okay in that silence or trying to like sit through that time where you feel like you've given all your ideas and be patient. And then the crazy ones come out. So in this case, oh, cool. someone said, oh my God, we should just poke their eyes out. Right. And, uh, but that was the idea that got them thinking about hiring visually impaired employees and who were actually more efficient and had less breakage. And they got grants and subsidies for hiring people with disabilities. So it turned into this like amazing idea oh. based on like, let's just poke their eyes out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know I, I, I don't even know where to go with that right now. <laughs> I mean, I was starting to list off uh, in my head, like all the reasons why people can get fired. And then I felt like, oh, I might be telling too many of my clients a <laughs> secret. So I'm glad that's where you took this, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, I don't think there's any more questions that I've got here for anyone. I'll give like one more minute. But just looking at the time, I think that is, this is a perfect segue into just saying, I am so pumped. Caroline, that you were here and part of our inaugural episode. Um, I love that this is going to be both uh, a link that people can access afterwards, kind of like a podcast, but also so that people can be here, ask real time stories. And, and you really just helped me to make this come to life. I love that, you know, you are in the space. Elevated for sure could put up their hands and say, sure, we can teach you creativity. We can't, not the way you do it, not the way. And I love just being able to bring you in. I know you made that significant impact on the cohort that came through our leadership essential. Um, and I've heard and, and you know and I even have had you had the opportunity to see you live with um, I belong to women's presidents organization we brought you in there you helped us through um, something there as well and well or helped us to tap into that creativity um, so how do we find you how can others you know see how they can bring you in how, uh, support maybe if they're feeling like yeah yeah, we could maybe do something new with the creativity thing. How can we find you? I, I, I think you have a website. Actually, I think you have a brand new website, don't you? A brand new website. Yes. Um, I have a designer who I pushed a bit out of her comfort zone. I was, I, I talk about having champagne taste with beer money. And so she delivered this great uh, website. It's my name, carolinebrookfield.com. And I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. We were talking earlier, I'm on Twitter, but not really. It's like a gym membership. I, I'm there, but I'm never, I never put my set foot in it. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for how I was so honored and so excited to be your first guest. And it's, I think this is going to be an amazing series for people in HR that, you know, need a connection to a new way of thinking, a new way of doing something, whether it's creativity or any of the other topics you're going to cover. So, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited. We've got some really great guests. We're going to be showcasing, you know, HR managers who have done some really cool things, not worked with us again, but just some really cool things so that they can truly show and tell, you know, talk about and celebrate again, the amazing things that are happening in our community. Um, you've been gracious enough as well to put together a really great PDF. I think you talked about 25 things. We're going to send that out to everybody that has either signed up that's here today or has signed up. So you're going to get that. I think we're going to make, we're going to have to start making like a list. I think you, you mentioned so many great resources, so many books, those kinds of things. Um, that we'll also send out that they can tap into as well. Um, pretty excited about that. But yes, just thank you so, so much. I, I, I hope others uh, reach out to you to figure out some new and idea, uh, new ideas on how to bring creativity into their organization. And again, even if they just need to understand how do we talk to our, our you know, the executives in our organization or how, what are some ways that we can do that? I think you are amazing, again, at the, the data, the statistics of really bringing that home for organizations. And so as we close out today, I just want to also say that our next episode is actually already going to be on February 2nd. And one of my very favorite people in the world, Saira Ganji, will be talking all things workplace investigations, um, which can sound kind of you know, scary. And that's actually part of what we're going to be talking about is we want to make workplace investigations less scary, less scary for the people that have to participate. Um, and Syra also has a really great tool that she's created where you can make sure that you've set up 
um, essentially your your program, your investigation the right way if you are an HR practitioner and doing it. But we're also going to talk about the advantages of bringing in a third party during that. Syra also has the most amazing stories around investigations and some of the craziest things she's done. But if anyone knows Syra, you also know that she is very prim and proper. But I'm going to try really hard to get some juicy stories out of her, as juicy as we can go. Um, Because I think that there's some (laughs) there's some really fun stuff that you can have. Oh, you know what, just as we quickly go here. um, Yeah, no, that seems to be, I think, I think that's it. So awesome. Yeah, I would love to see if anybody does any of the 25 things, please like email me or, you know, let me know because part of the joy of creativity is sharing it and uh, feeling proud of yourself for doing something a little bit different. Okay, well, and in honor of dance, can you just say what dance stands for one more time? In honor of dance, I've got something, but what does it it stand for? Dance stands for daydream, ambiguity, novelty, curiosity, and editing later. Editing later. Yeah, write drunk, edit sober. Okay, yeah, that's my favorite. (laughs) Uh, But that being said, every time I think of dancing, there is one uh, uh, individual or, or, or like a clip from Seinfeld that always comes up. It is, do you, do you know the one that I'm going to be talking about here? Yeah, I do. Yeah. With yeah. Elaine. Uh, Elaine. Yeah. And, uh, let's play it out as we leave. Thanks everyone awesome. for joining us. Yeah. Today. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks so much, Michelle. <laughs> It is totally how I dance. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.